I'm Luciana, I'm the co-president of Liberty Society, and today we have the first speaker of the year, Mark Goldman. And well, um, he is the head of Cool Girl Person in Student Economic Affairs. Also, he is leading a society which is focusing on history and liberty values in general, the Cuban society. Um, also, he writes for the conservative fund of home, if I'm not mistaken. And Joe, who is going to be interviewing Mark, he's our events coordinator, and he also uh, has his own podcast, uh, the Crimson Podcast, uh, with uh, Gans and Havens. So, if anyone actually can, you can find the podcast as well in our, in our social media. And yeah, I hope that everybody enjoys it. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so Being the head of cultural affairs at the Institute of Economic Affairs is not as grand as it sounds because I am the head of a department of one. Right. So it's me. That's it. So well, well, tell it's us, not a huge. Uh, <laughs> well, tell us. Well, tell us about that. I mean, I'm I'm curious to know because we hear these terms all the time with the think tanks and, and all that kind of. Mm -hmm. Can you can you tell us more about what what that is? Like, what does it mean to be to be part of a think tank? What is what what does it mean for you to be the head of that? Think tank. That well, mean? I'm not the head of the think tank. So the Institute of Economic Affairs um, kicked off in the 1950s um, at a time when classical liberal ideas uh, were not exactly very prominent in the context of post-war uh, Britain. And it was started by a Second World War fighter pilot uh, hero who called Anthony Fisher, who... Um, put his money where his mouth was and set up, he bought a house in the middle of Westminster to house the Institute because after the war he became, he was a, a very successful self-made entrepreneur and he wanted liberal ideas to be injected into the political debate in a way they weren't being in, in that period. Mm -hmm. So its focus has always been economics. It was very influential, uh, particularly in the in the 70s and early 80s during the, the sort of the Thatcher uh, revolution. Uh, but times have obviously changed and um, the Institute has decided to try and extend its remit into the realm of culture because liberal ideas are clearly as we see it, uh, under extraordinary threat uh, in this society and, and, you know, throughout the Western world, particularly the, the Anglosphere. So uh, Mark Littlewood, who's the very sort of charismatic head of the Institute, uh, invited me to come and try and kickstart the cultural program right. and to particularly focus on the value of free speech. So I interact a lot with people on the traditional left, for example, of British politics, who don't agree with us at all on economics, who are not economic liberals, uh, but who are political liberals and concerned about what is happening in this society and particularly, of course, within higher education. Well, this is, well, this is actually a really interesting thing. Now that you say that, you know, you're talking about reaching across the aisle. The, the, one of the biggest problems, at least, that I find um, especially being a Canadian, um, is that is that we often have these very difficult conversations um, with people across the aisle, right? So have you had any of those kinds of difficulties reaching out to other people who would traditionally not be conservative or tr would traditionally not be liberal? It just, it seems as though these factions are very, very far apart. But sometimes I find that, especially when you're talking to people who aren't, who don't, mm. you know, kind of lean into your, into your, ideology, it, it seems like we can agree on this particular thing, right? If it, you know, like we can agree on, on, let's say, free speech. We can agree on, you know, issues of transgenderism. We can agree, despite the fact that, that let's say, somebody's a conservative and somebody's a liberal, but we can meet here. Do you, is that really kind of your experience, or have you, or is it more difficult than, 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 than what I'm laying out? Um, it's both difficult and not difficult. It's not difficult with the traditional left. Uh, by which I mean, on the one hand, traditional social democrats who are, have impeccable democratic credentials and believe in free speech. Right. Um, and also, weirdly, now we're seeing the evolution of a movement that had its origins in classical Marxism, um, but is horrified by the way in which 
the new left, what I call the culture control left, has uh, metamorphosized. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the website Spiked Online. Um, but that has its origins in a small Trotskyite tendency uh, called the Revolutionary Communist Party, which I remember at university. Right. And the leader of the party on the Warwick University campus was Claire Fox, who then went on to become a, a Brexit MEP. She's now in the House of Lords, even though she says she wants to destroy the House of Lords. Um, well, it and, seems that that's, that's where a lot of politicians, they go, they just, they just want to destroy everything, it seems. I'm not sure if that's... that's well, I, 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 no, I think she, she's consistent, right. uh, but she said, look, I'm going to use this as a platform, right. but, you know, um, I, I, I actually want to abolish this place right. or replace it, at least, with an elected chamber. So Claire Fox is doing great work. I think she's now called the Lady Barton, so I always make, um, make amusing references to that when I, I bump into her around uh, Parliament. So on the one hand, you've got the sort of the traditional left, be they social democrats or very classical Marxists, who don't like the whole new left obsession right. with cultural politics, the culture war, uh, transgenderism, uh, and so on and so forth. And the people in that tendency, who I imagine are uh, pr probably very prominent at this right. university, I don't know, but you, you, <laughs> perhaps you'll tell me about that, they don't believe in debate on principle. Right. So I've tried to uh, find people to come and actually create a debate about transgenderism. Um, and they say that this shouldn't be debated on principle, uh, that it's a human rights violation even to challenge uh, the notion that a biological um, man uh, cannot, uh, through self-identification, become a woman. So they don't believe fundamentally in, in freedom of speech for reasons we may come on to later yeah. because I think it's, and I'll be interested to know what the views of you here are, but I think it's intimately connected to postmodernism, uh, which is something the traditional left, to their credit, reject. I think postmodernism has a lot to answer for and what we're experiencing in higher education, but, but throughout British society, it's now permeating the practice of the police uh, and all public sector institutions. Right. Well, anyway. well, this is well, this is the thing. I mean, I know that, and just just talking about it generally, because I know we've we've been focusing on on politics a lot more. But, but I wanted to ask you just generally before we before we dive into to these topics of free speech and transgenderism and, and so on and so forth, is the idea of the culture war, right? And and this is something that you hear a lot. Again, I'm 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 a Canadian, right? You know, a fish out of water. So so our idea of, of a culture war is something that is very bloody, very messy. Uh, it's complex. Everybody takes these sides, and we're all just people, just kind of huddled up against a wall, waiting for somebody to kind of make the first move. And so we're 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 very apprehensive about it. But I was hoping that maybe you can give me your your take on that. Like, what does it mean to be part of a culture war? Are we part of a culture war? What are some of these topics that some of these battles that we have in a culture war? What does that mean exactly? I think the concept of the culture war is intimately connected to the emergence of identity politics. And I think any society that starts to define itself in terms of groups who have supposedly mutually exclusive interests by virtue of their sex, their ethnicity, their religion, or what have you, is in a very, very dangerous place. Mm. Uh, so in a democratic society, it is healthy that you have groups of people who have different views, um, who contest ideas, who contest politics, that you have political parties that straddle all kinds of groups within the society, uh, and that there's some sort of battle of ideas. A battle of ideas to me is very different from a culture war, so and that's what we're now, I think, um, moving into, whereby the ideologues of the new left, uh, there, there are some, it has to be said, on what might be called the identitarian right as well, are trying to get people within our society, are trying to get us to define ourselves uh, within the context of identity groups rather than groups of people who just so happen to have different uh, uh, material interests, different ideas about what is best for our society. That is legitimate uh, politics, 
But what we're moving into is something quite different. And that's why you're now getting this tendency towards, you know, uh, cancelling people, culturally trying to get people to be either prosecuted or to lose their livelihoods because of the views they express. And in some cases, as we saw in Brighton a, a few weeks ago, when the, a group of feminists uh, tried to have an event um, about the transgender issue, I mean, they were physically attacked by, you know, very sinister people dressed in all black um, from the Antifa movement. So that is a kind of a, a really disturbing, disturbing indication of where I think we're beginning to move. And we saw what happened. I mean, this may sound shrill uh, and maybe over-exaggerated, but I think we saw in kind of the interwar period in Germany what happens when you get real serious uh, culture war and you get political movements that don't define themselves around sets of ideas and try to appeal to all individuals potentially within the society. You have political movements saying, we represent this particular ethnic strain or religious strain or whatever it is within the society, and this other group, they are the outgroup, they are the enemy. Right. They're so, a privileged elite. Right, so then, so then why is this different thing? I mean, just to kind of just push you a little bit on it, because mm. I, I, think, I think what you're describing, see, they seem to be very parallel to each other. If we're, if we're to suggest... Right, that 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 really this is a free market of ideas where somebody has just so happens to have this idea, and then somebody else has to have this idea, right? So let's say that we're talking about abortion, for example, just just yeah. to throw just to throw just to throw a hand grenade in there, mm -hmm. but just let's say we're talking about abortion. You have these two sides that can come together in the middle and basically talk, but but when you talk about a culture war, right? I mean, that sounds like it's the same thing, but what? But the outcome seems to be a lot more gruesome, you know. And and you've and you've mentioned it in. In you know uh, just just now that that people are getting cancelled, um, Kathleen Stock. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. She she was a, unironically a philosophy professor here at, at the University of Sussex, and she was not run out by the university, right? Because the university stood by her, right? The university put out a statement. Oh, well, that's good. I didn't know that. Well, yeah. well, this is well, this is my issue. I mean, mm. I mean, we can talk about Kathleen Stock in just a minute. I have my own issues in terms of how the university handled it, but but she wasn't run out by the university. She was run out by the trans activists, right? And you're talking about somebody who 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 predicates themselves on, on, uh, on, on a topic where you're supposed to have these kinds of ideas. It's philosophy, right? Like that's, that's what philosophy is, is predicated on. So, so, I, so, so I just want to know what you think is the difference here because if you're talking about a free market of ideas, then the culture war seems to be predicated on that as well. But, but the consequences are a lot more severe. I mean, I mean, what's, I mean why do you think that difference has been created? Like, what because, do you think the, because those pursuing culture war... This is precisely use the word ideas. They're not based upon ideas. Mm -hmm. What it's based upon is a kind of Nietzscheian will to power um, perspective um, and inclination. When you see societies divided by groups who have mutually exclusive interests, as they argue, mm -hmm. then in fact you're not wanting a philosophical debate about abortion Right. or any issue, what you're trying to do is to impose your particular view, which you say is intimately connected to a particular group of people, mm -hmm. and that this is in their collective interests. So, if you, going back to my point about interwar Germany, um, what we saw in that period was, in fact, the abandonment of philosophical debate. Mm. The Nazi party was very explicit, particularly if you look at, say, their chief philosopher, Martin Heidegger. They wanted to erase what they called foundational debate or philosophy because they associated, associated that with the European Enlightenment and they associated that with liberalism. Mm. And they said politics is not about ideas. We're not interested in a, a debate. We don't have to debate. We are the representatives <laughs> of the German Volk, and we are involved in a life and death struggle uh, with these uh, Jewish capitalist interests who are, you know, uh, who have privilege and they have power and we're going to take the power from them. And you see parallels with the kind of language that the new left, I think, use 
in this society and other societies where they talk about the patriarchy, men collectively are oppressing women. If you look at critical race theory, uh, this argues that there is uh, white supremacy uh, and that members of ethnic minorities are oppressed by definition uh, within this society and that white people collectively are oppressors. So there are certain parallels, it seems to me, um, between the way in which the new left uh, analyze the society we live in and the type of politics we saw emerging within the fascist uh, countries of Europe. Um, and they're very, very dangerous, I would argue. Right. So what, we're nowhere near where, obviously, um, Germany, Austria, Italy, France uh, ended up in the 30s and 40s. But I'm worried that if these trends continue then it, in fact, will be impossible to have a, you know, an, even a meeting like this because you will be, the Libertas Society will be defined as being a group of people who are helping to maintain the structures of power and injust, social injustice within the society, and therefore you have to be closed down. And that is what is happening all over the country. I mean, I think of a, a feminist society is just being closed down at Swansea University because they don't take the trans line. So we're seeing this sort of beginning to happen, but it's on a small scale. And at the moment, we don't see huge amounts of violence, but there's a kind of whiff of violence in the air, um, you know, particularly on the trans issue. Well, there's, well, there's one, one issue, just to go on that, just to make these kinds of parallels. I know that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the interview or the very infamous and famous interview that Jordan Peterson had with Kathy Newman. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Yes. So there was a part of that interview where, where he's talking about um, where he says that uh, he compares the, the trans activists to to Maoists, right? And so Kathy Newman, um, at least in my opinion, she she doesn't take that question very well. She she doesn't understand the nuance. And I think this is kind of the, the problem. I, I think that that what you're saying, I, I agree with you to an extent because we're not actually talking about them, you know, taking the lives of, of millions and millions of people. That's not what we're talking about here. What 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 Jordan Peterson was saying, and what I think you're saying, maybe you could expand on it, is that it's really the utterances. That they're making the attitudes that they have, the actions that they perform by canceling people, or, 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 or you know, attempting. Yeah. I mean, we, we, there is violence in the air. Oh, I mean, absolutely. There is yeah. the attempt to, um, you know, smash up meetings organized by the people they call turfs. I mean, this has right. happened in Bristol. Uh, well, Ka it's well, it's happened. Stark. You know, we Kathleen saw. Stark is a turf. Yeah. Right? So yeah. So she was yeah. uh, physically harassed. So okay, it's it. We see with Extinction Rebellion, uh, for example. Just before COVID started, they prevented the distribution of national newspapers, um, and because they wanted to stop the Times and the Telegraph, I think in particular, from being distributed, yeah. they gave themselves license to stop the distribution of national newspapers, uh, which you know uh, is an extraordinary thing to do in a democratic society if you if you adhere to liberal democratic principles, which they actually overtly now say they don't because they say there isn't time for democratic debate because of the, the climate emergency and what have you. So they're just giving themselves license. You know, they're, they're about to start a whole campaign in central London where they're going to try to clog up the streets, stop people going about their business. They were talking about blockading parliament to stop parliament meeting. So there are indications of very, very disturbing things beginning to happen within the culture. And I would suggest that part of the reason for this is the way in which, going back to your reference to Jordan Peterson uh, and his claim that there was a sort of Maoist um, whiff in the air um, with regards to, 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 to what is happening, is that Postmodernist ideas are predicated on the idea or the belief that language is a form of coercive power. Right. So it's not the means by which we exchange divergent opinions in this realm of throughout society. It's not the way in which human beings uniquely amongst the different species of animal are able to represent the thoughts we have in language to try to make the often 
inchoate ideas we have within our heads. We try to put them into some order through um, speech, which Jordan Peterson has written a, a lot about as a psychologist. It's, it's, it's a process which is utterly unique to human beings and which is absolutely vital uh, with regards to civilization. If you depart from that idea and a fundamental respect for the right of every single individual human being to articulate whatever beliefs they want to, to express whatever opinions they, they have, no matter how much you may disagree with them, then you enter a different type of society, a society based upon force and ultimately barbarity. And we're seeing you know, what's happening in Iran. Uh, we just look at China. Um, we look at Qatar, we look at Saudi Arabia, we look at societies where, in fact, that very fundamental liberal principle um, that emerged in, I mean, in this country, I would argue that the, the Civil War, you know, was in a way, the way in which that idea started to become enshrined politically when... Uh, the parliamentarians took on the king. Uh, and one of the key defining principles of the leveller movement and the, the radical movement within the, the parliamentary um, uh, coalition was the right to religious freedom of conscience, conscience and the right to uh, express your, your beliefs. And that was a key uh, moment and once the civil war was won by the parliamentarians, I think we were then on a sort of inevitable journey towards liberal democracy. Right. Um, so if you perceive language, though, in a totally different way, and you see it as a threat to the particular values stroke the interest groups you claim to represent, uh, then, in fact, of course, the logic is that the more censorship you have, the more freedom you have. I mean, let me give you a quote yeah. um, by a fairly recent Labour MP called Nadia Witten, who's a sort of Alexander <laughs> Ocasio-Cortez <is>. type <laughs> uh, new left uh, politician. And she said, and she was speaking in relation to the trans uh, debate, and I quote, we must not fetishize debate as though debate is itself an innocuous, neutral act. The very act of debate in these cases is an effective rollback of assumed equality and a foot in the door for doubt and hatred. Well, the logic of this is highly authoritarian. She is basically saying that the more censorship um, there is... Um, the freer the society will be. She's saying we're not even allowed to doubt any particular position she adheres to. Well, this is an extraordinary um, thing for a parliamentarian, isn't it, to but say? But, that's, but that also seems to be predicated, actually, just to go back on your previous point about being able to categorize speech in a certain way. I mean, that, that stems from speech as violence. Right, mm. that, that the idea because because at least and me, even silence is yeah violence. exactly I mean, right so you, know, for, you have it both ways yeah, yeah I'm not sure how you do that but but you know but I've always seen violence or as kind of like this objective measure right like the violence is is objective I think right and I and I've always believed that that you know you know when something violent is happening but but when you but when you equate violence to speech or even silence you know silence to, to violence it we we seem to kind of lose. That, that kind of ob objective view of what, of what we consider violence to be. So BLM, the BLM riots that happened, uh, the riots in, in Charlottesville, the riots after the Derek Blake. I mean, well, I'm giving you North American references. Again, I'm right. North American. But what happened with, uh, with George Floyd in, in Minneapolis, what happened with Derek Blake in, uh, uh, in uh, Waukesha, uh, and that was the whole Kyle Rittenhouse thing. So th for those of you who don't know, um, that's violence. Right, that's violence, right? We know that's violence because because buildings were being burned down despite the fact that there were news reporters saying, oh yeah, you know, 98% of, you know, <laughs> peaceful protests while all the burning, all the buildings were burning down behind them. So I just think that, I just think that one of the biggest issues, especially, and this is, and, and I agree with you 100% on this, that we're kind of losing 
kind of our we're, we're, we're becoming untethered to to what we see as an objective view of violence and when you lose that objectivity right then anything can be violent you're violent i'm violent this meeting is violent right and so I, I and so I don't know if you have I don't know if you if my assessment is wrong I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I think this this goes back to postmodernism because the essence of Western rationalism was that the individual uh, was the primary unit of social analysis and. Um, the entity that should be the recipient of rights. Mm. So the belief emerged and became dominant in the Western world that we did not exist as human beings in a chain um, of command, uh, an ontological chain reaching from God through monarchs, the aristocracy, the leading figures in the established church down to the rest of us who, according to this theory of there, there being a chain of being, we would be closer to the beasts and that only the members of the elite had a soul. The revolutionary idea in the Civil War, which then gets expression in the United States uh, Constitution later and within the American Revolution against the British Crown, is that there is an equality of souls, that every human being has the same essence. That And so it was a recognition of the fact that we were fundamentally equal and should be treated politically and legally as equal entities. Um, and... That rationalist perspective also included the belief that because we had agency as part of our nature, um, that we were not predetermined, that they believed uh, God had given us this capacity for free will and agency, and that it could only be violated by other human beings engaging in acts of overt aggression. And so you see this theory articulated by, by John Locke and then later by Thomas Paine, who became a big figure in the uh, American Revolution. And so the, the whole concept of natural rights grows out of this rationalist idea. What we're now seeing is a return to a pre-modern, pre-enlightenment understanding of what power is, which is just as you put it, and it is that there are ineffable forms of power, mysterious forms of power out there, which determine what happens, in this case, to entire groups of people. And so it is said that you know, men collectively exert this mysterious kind of power over all women, even though legally speaking, from the uh, you know from about a hundred years ago, we established political and legal equality. Right. Um, uh, I mean, there were other things, reforms that needed to happen, but which over time did happen. Again, there was a sort of inexorable logic to the movement towards a politically and legally equal society. What postmodernism is now <coughs> saying is that forget all that stuff. This isn't real freedom. This isn't real equality. Um, there are these other forms of power which can't be empirically identified, can't be shown to exist, uh, rationally speaking, but they exist, and they exist in large measure because of language and what is said. And so once you go down that path, then, in fact, you can define virtually anything as an act of aggression it's 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 no longer about an overtly self um, uh, another regarding action right. like a fist in the face, which it is then becomes obvious, yeah. you know a microaggression, the way you look at me, the way I look at you, and and, and so on and so right. forth. So that basically, this gives license to define anything, virtually anything, as a form of power, and this is what the French postmodernists, the poststructuralists, uh, were essentially arguing in the 1960s and 70s that then became the dominant idea within 
uh, American academia, and it's now over here. You see it in the culture, culture and media studies departments of universities, where it is said um, that what is communicated um, is you know, through through the media, through social media. Are, are forms of power. And that is why they then say, oh, well, we need more state intervention. We need more state control to control what, how individuals communicate. Well this, is, well, this is actually very interesting because I know, at least, so I'll, I'll, we're going to kind of just switch gears a minute because I, think, because I think when we talk about free speech, right, I think free speech is, is embedded in, in, in what you're saying because one of the biggest issues that we have with, with free speech is essentially twofold. One, is whether or not we can say whatever we want. Now, I'm being reductive here, but whether or not we can say whatever we want, right? And when we define free speech, we have to ask ourselves, as, as you're saying, who is the person or the people or the group or, or the institution that is defining what hate speech is, you see? And so, and so I, guess, I guess what I, what I really wanted to ask you, because, a lot, because, again, as a North American, we seem to know what free speech? We seem to think to, that we know what free speech. I mean, in the U.S., it's enshrined in 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 their in their constitution. Um, in Canada, we we don't really have any kind of semblance of free speech. It's more like you you protect the expression, right? So you don't protect the content. You you protect the way in which the content goes out. So in other words, the medium is the message, as as uh, as, as uh, McLuhan would say. So I guess I guess what I wanted to ask you is kind of the opposite of that. So in your opinion, what does not having free speech look like? What is what does that look like to you when you don't have it? What does that mean? Well, it means that an essential part of your human nature, um, the thing that fundamentally defines you as being a human being, having powers of cognition that you can give expression to through communication, and which enable not just social advance in terms of technological advance or artistic advance, but actually make liberal democracy possible. Mm. It's the way in which our differences of interest and belief can be reconciled peacefully. If you start taking that away from us and saying there are a whole range of issues you're not allowed to talk about that are off the political agenda for discussion, then you're on the slippery slope towards a society, as in pre-revolutionary uh, Britain, where only the elite could speak. They reserved for themselves the right to make laws. I mean, Charles I said, I've been ordained by God, I'm God's representative on earth. I don't have to go to Parliament and worry about what the parliamentarians uh, think. I'm just going to impose the policies I want because I've been chosen by God. Mm. Um, so you then, what happens is that we enter a genuinely unequal society where a lot of people have a lot more control and power than you or I do, and our capacity to exert agency, our personal autonomy, but also to contribute to the collective political life of the society becomes seriously undermined. What happens is that di the dice get loaded in favour of certain positions and certain movements within the society. And those of us who hold what are considered to be transgressive uh, political positions, we get silenced or we get threatened into not articulating those views, and that's exactly what we see in Iran. Well, this is, but this is, but, but just to go off, I mean, we'll we'll come back to Iran in just a minute, but because I I wanted to just kind of push back a little bit on on this concept of 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 having this kind of agency, because um, just to just to kind of sell you the conversation a little bit. In Canada, we had this one because because you just reminded me of this. We had this one hockey commentator by the name of Don Cherry. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. I'm not. D don't worry about it. You don't have to know. <laughs> I only know about British football. <laughs> uh, so, but he was he had he had his own segment called Coach's Corner, and Coach's right. Corner appeared in a long in a bigger broadcast hockey broadcast called Hockey Night in Canada. Now, Don Cherry, he's a very loud, obnoxious uh, commentator. His claim to fame is that he was the, the captain for the Boston Bruins. He he, he won them the, the Stanley Cup. Anyways, it doesn't matter. 
The point is that he's very loud, obnoxious, right? And so one, one, at one point during this broadcast, live broadcast, he says, he says, these immigrants, they come to our country, so Canada, they come to country, they, to our country, they drink our honey, they take our resources, and blah, blah, blah. So he makes, he, so in other words, he pretty much goes, these are the reasons why I don't like immigrants, A, B, C, D, during a live broadcast. And so, of course, subsequently, he, his contract was terminated, he was fired, right? So, so in Canada, there was this big debate about, about free speech, and it brought up two issues. Now, the first issue is really a, a more legal issue in terms of whether or not we can contract out our free speech. So in other words, there are contracts that you can sign that have what are referred to as controversy clauses. So in other words, so for those of you who don't know, um, if you say something that our parent company disagrees with, right, we have every right to terminate your contract. That's it. We can talk about that after if you'd like. But, but the question that I really want to focus on here, right, because when you're talking about agency is really consequences, right? Because it could, because Don Cherry had, I mean, Don, if you, I mean, if you, if you do any research on this guy, right, he has a lot of agency. He's loud. Right? He does whatever he wants. He says whatever he wants. But, but is it possible like, that, that you, you simply can't divorce the two? I mean, if you're, if you're driving in a car and you're driving as fast as you can, as straight as you can, eventually you're going to hit something, right? So, so would you agree with that? I mean, do you think that, that free speech and consequences are, can be divorced from one another? Or, or do you think that they have to be, they have to be together? Because, we, because the agency is really the issue here, right? Because if we're talking about silencing yourself, censoring yourself, as you, as you say, right? I mean, isn't it also possible that we fear the consequences of free speech? Or am I wrong? Or do you, or is that assessment No, wrong? I mean, I think there's a difference between the right to free speech and the capacity to free speech. I don't have the right to turn up at the Labour Party conference, say, and demand the right to give them a five-hour speech. Mm. The Labour Party saying, thank you, but actually no thanks, is not a violation of my right to free speech. The Labour Party is a private institution, and they can decide who has freedom of speech and not, and they can then expel, I don't know, uh, Jeremy Corbyn or, you know, George Galloway or whoever they want to expel, who they then say, well, their views do not correspond to those of uh, the Labour Party, and so uh, goodbye. Um, I don't have the right to come to this uh, establishment um, and say whatever I want to say. I have the right to say, I think, uh, I'm a free speech fundamentalist, I have the right to say whatever it is I want to say on my private property or the property of people who allow me, you know, into their space uh, uh, and invite me to say whatever it is I, I, I want to say. But I don't have um, a total right to, to come here and say stuff that, maybe you find beyond the pale and you can suddenly terminate this interview and say goodbye when you get out of the building, please, or right. call security. Um, so the fundamental right to freedom of speech, um, it doesn't seem to me is compromised by other individuals exercising their equal right in relation to the space they control. And the same, therefore, applies to a company with regards to this gentleman. Right. If they think he broke his his contract by saying a whole range of things they didn't want to be associated with, well then yeah, he he had to face the consequences of that. Which, which is very so. Interesting, the, yeah. So, but then the, again, there's a fundamental difference between speech within a private context, which is you know, um, of which you gave an example, and speech within the public realm within the realm of political processes which belong to the society collectively. So I would argue, you know, the state does not have a right to limit what you or I can say on any subject whatsoever. Um, but our capacity to articulate that is related to the private processes and spheres within which we try to communicate those ideas. But nobody, I would argue, has the right to stop any of us standing for Parliament on whatever political platform, no matter how crazy or obnoxious most people might, might find it. Because once you do that, then you are compromising the democratic uh, process whereby we each, in theory, should have an equal opportunity to try and convince other people of our beliefs. So then, so then, um, so then, do you think Twitter is that 
platform then? I mean, I know it sounds it kind of mm. it seems kind of out of left field because we have two big figures, right? So, and and I'm particularly talking about Andrew Tate and Alex Jones, right? Where where or Donald Trump, we can say Donald Trump as well, right? He was let back onto onto the platform, um, but but Alex Jones wasn't, despite the fact that Elon Musk, who is now the the the, the owner of Twitter, uh, saying that he's a free speech absolutist, right? So, 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 do you have any comment in regard to these social media platforms that kind of exist that seem to kind of exist in the middle, where where we still have this one agent, right? So, in this case, it would be Elon Musk saying, "You're banned, you're banned, you're not banned, you're not banned," and so on and so forth. I mean, I mean, does that does that kind of shift the paradigm of free speech in in any way, or or do you think that Elon Musk is actually actually contributing to to this idea of free speech absolutism? Well, um. Speaking personally, mm. I want to see as many crazy different views articulated, right. uh, including very offensive ones, uh, because I believe that's healthy, in part because uh, it's not just the right of individuals to express them, but also crazy bad ideas get challenged publicly um, and often demolished precisely because they're given a platform. Mm. So... A few years ago, the BBC, and this caused uproar, and they certainly wouldn't do it today, gave, invited the leader of the British National Party, Nick Griffin, on to question time. Um, and I thought, well, that's great. A, because the BNP should have, uh, on principle, some possibility to try and persuade people, but also because I was pretty confident that they would get demolished or he would get demolished in the context right. of the debate, which was the case. I mean, it, it, it completely destroyed his credibility. So I have a personal preference as a sort of free speech fanatic in general for let a thousand flowers bloom, no matter how obnoxious some of those um, flowers are. But I don't control, it may surprise you to learn, a, a major <laughs> social platform, in which case I would say, yeah, you know, Alex Jones, or, who's the other guy? Who's, he's, uh, Andrew, well, Andrew Tate. Tate. Yeah, Andrew he's Tate a was... sort of what pickup artist type. Uh, yeah, so he Bo was... Kickboxer he, or something. He, well, he was a former kickboxer. Um, oh, right. and, then, and then basically his claim to fame was that he was just trying to instill kind of confidence in, in, in mas right. with masculinity and so on. So, I mean, I mean yeah. obviously your mileage will vary in regard to what your opinion of him is, but that's generally yeah. his shtick. Of, right. of what he does, but but Donald Trump infamously was. I mean, he was kicked off Twitter, and then he was reinstated. So now he's back on Twitter. Right. Uh, Andrew Tate, I'm not sure if he's back on. Um, I, I'm sure Elon Musk will will come around, but <laughs> but, yeah. but uh, Donald Trump is back on yeah. now. Where so. I Elon Musk, um, if I was to identify myself as Elon Musk for a moment, then I would say, yeah, the, the, let let all the loonies in, uh, and they can say whatever they want. But right. I accept that Elon Musk has the right to terminate whoever he wants right. from his own because he's paying for it or he's in control of it or he's paid yeah. to buy the company. Um, so I don't think there's a fundamental contradiction uh, between the principle of a natural right to free speech and private institutions um, uh, making these kind of decisions. However, that doesn't stop us as individuals criticizing private institutions from um, engaging in what I call asymmetrical censorship. Mm. So I think that within higher education, I can't speak for the University of Sussex, which you obviously all know about, <laughs> but there are clearly institutions in this country where if you hold particular types of belief, uh, then the university stroke, the student union, will seek to have you no know, platformed, whereas people who put... A different perspective on those issues are welcomed with open arms and no restrictions are placed upon them. Now universities are a complex type of institution in this context because of course while they're on seen from one perspective they're private institutions so okay do what they like ban whoever they like like a, a private members club uh, they get state money so they're partially state institutions they also get not the royal warrant, but whatever, I've, I've forgotten the, the term, but they can issue degrees that are legally recognized right, because yeah. they get this state seal of approval. So they're intimately connected with uh, 
the the public sphere, the state sphere, and they get a percentage of their income comes from the taxpayer. So it does be, then become a very complex issue as to what it is legitimate for student unions to ban or not ban. Uh, and they, it seems to me, operate in a different type of uh, category from, say, I don't know, a private members club like the Carlton Club, who that's a private institution and they can do whatever they like. It's a conservative club. And so they, it seems to me quite legitimate for them to say, oh, we only want to allow people who are conservatives or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, yeah, you, it's, it's just it's very interesting because, uh, again, we... I mean, university is kind of grey area. That's why yeah, I'm not giving well, you a very good No, no, yeah, and, and that's, but, I mean, but, that's, but that's really the issue, right? Because I think I think at one point, uh, if I remember, I mean, now you, you could probably correct me on this, but I, I know that uh, Parliament tried to pass, or they, they had an idea of an academic free speech bill. And I think and I think one of the biggest issues with that is that, is that you know, to, to what point... You know, should we, you know, should we codify um, universities having to give people platforms, despite the fact, as you say, that there's really this balance, this mix of money, of private money as well as state money, right? And so, just going back to Catherine Stock, because I think this is, because I think we're, we'll move into our our final topic with, with this too. But but Catherine Stock had that issue when when she was talking about um, about people being able to self uh, to self identify, right? And 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 what had happened with the university is that the university said, "Well, we're going to we're going to stand by her, her, uh, uh, her free speech, her academic free speech." Now, my issue with that, because I said I would t I would come back to this, my issue was that they it was too late, right? If they had said it like, like a year before she started to get into all of these problems, I, I think I think the, the trans activists would have left her alone. I think I think that if if, if the university had what, come, why do you think that had her interest? Uh, why they? Why they? Do why, why do you think that if the university had just said what they later said well, earlier, it, that these people would have stopped persecuting it? Well, the, the truth is that I thought it was more an issue of apprehension. I thought I think that the university didn't want to take a position so quickly, considering the fact that the University of Brighton and the University of Sussex are both are both considered to be very radical universities, and I don't think they wanted to draw that line in the sand. They wanted to. Now, this is just high, very speculative. It's it's very much to to say that. Uh, uh, to basically take a position before everything goes to shit, right? right? So, so, so if I, so if I said, so if you and I we were in a conversation and I would say to people, this is Mark, Mark is my friend, and and that's it, right? And if I say that to people before they even meet you, then they'll know what my position is. They'll know where I draw oh, my I line. Okay, the same, right. As opposed to, as opposed to, let's say, you know, they meet you for the first time and then I say, oh yeah, this is this is my friend. Mark and, and you know yeah but so, I don't think Antifa would give a shit as to whether you were my friend or not if they really wanted to come and pummel my head in or bow me from speaking well, I, think, well, I, mean, I don't know it would be very nice of you you know it'd be very touching and moving sure. but uh, I, I don't I don't know I'm just hazarding a guess it would have made any difference to Kathleen Stock these people would have been after her, they would have been having demonstrations outside the Senate building because the Senate wasn't uh, was wasn't. Well, I guess you know, I guess I guess my agreement. I don't know. I'm just, well, I guess my issue know. is that the, is that is that this idea of absolution from the university. Right. I think I think if if we're if we're to suggest mm. that the university really is taking a stand, then they have to take a stand. You know, oh, they where, should have done that. Yeah, in they should have, well, yeah, no, I totally well agree with you. But I'm just right? not. I'm just where I'm yeah. doubtful is as to whether it would have had much effect. Well, I mean, on, I suppose, on these kind of people. I suppose. I suppose. I'm trying. I suppose yeah. I'm seeing it through rosy colored specs. Yeah. But I mean, my, my, I suppose <laughs> my point is that is that yeah. is that I think that in principle they should have done it before, and I think it and maybe, hopefully, it would have given yeah. you know hindsight is twenty twenty would have given trans activists a little bit more pause to say, well, you know. Stock is is protected by the university, right? The university is backing her. Have you ever met some of these people? I mean, <laughs> have you seen them we, in action? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen yeah. them, and I, <laughs> th there's a reason they dress up in this sinister gear. They right. are a fascistic group of people who want to intimidate, who want to create a climate of fear, right. and that is what they're about. They wear balaclavas, you know. Um, so yeah, the, the the idea that these people, yeah, uh, you know, anyway. No, we'll but never I mean, know because it. No, yeah, like yeah, I said, hindsight yeah, is twenty twenty. I just, yeah. I suppose, I just like to think yeah. that 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 the university should take take a, yeah. a better position instead of instead of just last minute. No, going, no, yeah, we're, no. we're going to protect her. She's she's cool, right? Mm. But 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 now that we're talking about Kathleen Stock, I, I just wanted to just before we go to to the Q and A because we're we're running out yes. of time, um, I just wanted to touch on uh, this idea of transgenderism, and I just wanted to know just just to start things off, um, we we've had issues uh, regarding. Uh, 
spaces, and we're not talking about safe spaces. We're talking about sexed spaces, right? So, so, so in California, for example, in, very famously, there are inmates, male inmates, right, from very dangerous, from San Quentin and all of these very dangerous prisons, moving to to women's prisons. We've had that here. And it resulted in sex attacks right. within the jail. Yeah. yeah. So, so I was hoping maybe you can give me, uh, if you can elaborate on that, because because one of the, because one of the problems is that is that some people will say, no, we have to protect women's spaces, right? Which is which is which at least in my opinion is very is a, is a feminist position. That was that was mm-hmm. Kathleen Stock's position. Right? That was one of the things that, that basically you know got her I, I wouldn't say in trouble, but got the trans activists upset. And so and so really this question is more of a twofold question because you have this idea of taking that position but but also being in line having strange bedfellows because I don't identify myself as as feminist but 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 I agree with that. Right? I agree mm-hmm. that that there should be spaces specifically for for women like change rooms for example, uh women's jails let's say, right? And then spaces for men as well where you know men's change rooms and so on and so forth. So 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 would you agree with that assessment, or am I... Uh, am I yeah, I mean, again, it, it, it's, it's complicated, um, as with free speech in universities, uh, because, again, we have to make a distinction, I think, between private and public spaces. So um, a private space like a refuge set up for women who have been the subject of you know physical assault by their their boyfriends and, 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 and husbands or um it seems to me a totally entitled and it makes rational sense to say this is a space only for women and that a biological male claiming to be a woman you know, trans women are not women they are biological male, rationally speaking, do not and should not have the legal right to enter that space. Um, Equally, if there is a refuge run by transgender activists who say, actually, we want to allow biological males into such a place, well, fine, that's their business, and... Um, that's something they then have to negotiate with the female um, people who want to seek refuge there. Uh, so it seems to me these are pri- these are debates that should take place within a private context, and it's not for outsiders and, and not for the state to try and impose. Um, the position of Stonewall and all the, the, the trans activist groups is that even private spaces should not be allowed to block the entry of trans women into those privately controlled spaces. Now, obviously, when we're talking about jails, um, these are state uh, spaces. And I would argue that these should remain female only spaces not because i'm a feminist i'm I'm not a feminist obvious well obviously because i'm an individualist so i don't look at society in terms of groups and so i fundamentally disagree with the whole you know feminist analysis of society in in the same way I, i disagree with people who divide up society racially or religiously um but it seems to me and i've i've sort of come around to this partly through listening to the arguments of people who are feminists on this, that there is a biological, there is a fundamental, obviously, biological differences in terms of upper body weight. Mm. And um, that it makes sense not to have integrated prisons in the same way you shouldn't have integrated hospital wards where all kinds of stuff has gone on because of that this doesn't mean that i think that the old second wave feminist argument that you know uh men were all potential rapists and um uh you know we're we're an oppressor class is right obviously i disagree with that because i believe rationally speaking you have to look at the behavior of specific individuals and the vast majority 
of men do not go around engaging in physically sexually aggressive acts. But However, it seems to me quite legitimate for a state-controlled institution to say, just on balance of probability, we are going to not have biological males, even if they call themselves women, coming into those spaces, particularly... <laughs> 90-something percent of human activity, it makes no difference whether you're a man or a woman. It's, it, it's of no more relevance than what our different, you know, colours of eyes are, right. or, you know, whatever it is, our, our differences in height. The vast majority of events at which people who are male and female come together, those sexual differences are, are, are of no relevance, but they are relevant and very relevant in a in a minority of cases uh, in relation to, you know, um, uh, competitive sport, contact sport. Right. Um, well, you, well, UFC was, well, UFC was, was actually a very, was actually very infamous for that. I know, I know uh, Joe Rogan had made a few comments about Fallon right. Fox. I mean, I, I don't know if you watch UFC. I mean, I don't really watch UFC, but Fallon Fox is a, is a transgender woman. So transitioning from a man to a woman. And basically, Fallon Fox went into the ring and 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 I think like broke like skulls just by yeah. You know, well, I it mean, was just, yeah, that's it, clearly like, it's, yeah. yeah yeah. So there was, no, a, there no. was a, big a friend issue of mine. His that. his wife plays for a female rugby team. They turned up one morning in South End on Sea. They were t two very big blokes on the other side. They you know um, expressed their concern to the referee, who said. They uh, identify as women, and the rugby authorities in that area of Essex have decreed that you have to play the fixture, um, or you will forfeit the points, and you, the club may even be kicked out of the league if you refuse to play with trans women. Uh, so, you know, that is very serious stuff. Now, you might say, okay, well, this is a private, again, affair, and it's up to the Essex... Uh, rugby, female rugby union to decide, you know, what they want to do about that and people who don't like it can leave and set up a, a rival right. where they only have biological women playing rugby. I don't know, but that's a, that's a slightly, that was a, that was going off on a tangent, but contact sport is clearly a very, very dangerous right. you know, it's, it, it's there are some sports where it seems to me there's no logic in why men and women don't compete together. No, I don't know. Tennis or something is not a contact sport. I don't understand why people don't compete as individuals, but I know nothing about tennis, so <laughs> somebody might be able to tell me why um, they, they have to play separately, except right. in doubles. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming down uh, to the belly of the beast. Oh, well, thank you. Yes. In England. Uh, so I was a little anxious before I came here. Yeah, well, I mean, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're a good group. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yes, so there you go. Time. So, but yeah, but thank you for giving us your time. I really do appreciate no, it. No, it's been great. Yeah, ladies thank and gentlemen, you. Mark Glendening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, so so we're gonna have our we're gonna have our Q and A. Um, so uh, where's Luciana? Well, what? actually, I have some questions to ask you. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. we was like a reverse, <laughs> a reverse. Yeah, please. Yeah, so you you can ask them if you'd like. If you wanna. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean. Obviously, it may um, uh, you may have uh, realised that I'm from a different generation to you. Um, may have occurred to you that I'm 63 years of age, and so I was at university well over 40 years ago, at the University of Warwick, um, and I remember going there. I, I you know was from a sort of North London. I was a, a classic North London middle class brat who had never been subjected to any kind of censorship whatsoever by my, my very groovy parents. So I was watching the same sort of kind of stuff they would on TV or uh, at, the, at the movies. And I experienced my first um, act of censorship at university. I joined the, 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 the film society and I queued up to see a sort of cult film of the time called Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, which is oh, a kind of... Californian late 60s. It's Russ Myers. Russ, Russ Myers. Yes, yeah. who's now considered very politically yeah. incorrect, of course. But he was a sort of countercultural, you know, kind of made these kind of sex exploitation films. Anyway, so I joined a queue of overwhelmingly young men looking forward to seeing this strange <laughs> film. And somebody then came to the front of the queue from the film society and said, I'm terribly sorry, but tonight's performance. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls uh, has been banned by the Women's Society 
and uh, or they've said it should be banned, and the student union have upheld this. And there was sort of uproar, you know, shouting and screaming. And I, I was completely bemused, I mean, because I'd never experienced censorship, and I didn't quite understand why if one group of people on the campus didn't approve of this film, um, I should be prevented from seeing it, because nobody was forcing them to go see it. And at that time uh, in Britain, the, the impetus for censorship actually came from the sort of right of the political spectrum. So you had a lot of conservatives, particularly religious conservatives, saying that things that were blasphemous, no, they weren't trying to censor politically, but they were trying to censor on religious grounds, and often in relation to sex, which they, you know, in like too much sex on TV. And well, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is, is, is very much, <laughs> if, if, if anyone has ever seen it, but it's, it's, uh, but it, it's, it's very, I mean, that's what... Do you like the film? Sorry? Do you like the film? Well, I saw it a long time ago. It's, it's yeah. fine. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, dated, I, but yeah, I saw, I mean, Russ, well, Russ Meyer was known for that. Yeah, right? he was known for for making these scantily clad, you know, movies yeah, about yeah, scantily clad yeah, yeah. women. Yeah, exactly. Sort of yeah. Um, so. But anyway, so <laughs> so, but it was interesting that uh, yes, it was interesting that you the, the, the then kind of feminists, second wave feminists, uh, and the conservative religious types were sort of united about this kind of stuff, and it, you know, it's all it, it's all very dubious and must be banned. So I was completely uh, surprised by this, shaken by this, and that's what kind of. Uh, Took me and uh, becoming a uh, led to me becoming a free speech um, obsessive, somewhat swivel eyed on, on this subject. But what I find extraordinary now, and I, I don't get it because I'm a, I was socialised in a totally different generation, where even though there were there were debates about censorship in relation to this kind of stuff, broadly speaking, politically, nobody in Britain really argued for political censorship. Um, it was just seen as natural that we had different views and these should be openly expressed. And what, what I can't get a handle on is what is going on with your kind of generation, what's going on within higher education now. What's up with you guys? Well, that, yeah, what's, I mean, that's what's, really, what's going well, on here? You know, <laughs> well, why do you think this is? Why is there, there is this cultural change? Yeah, um, so you mentioned <coughs> society at your university planning uh, the film. Yeah. You have to imagine that those people uh, who are turned 60 and have positions of authority in the university, so perhaps uh, that's why poorly see within the university system happened. Oh, so it's a, it's a sort of march through the institutions? Yes. 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 But I mean, that's okay. That, that explains people <laughs> who are kind of my age. But <coughs> we see opinion polls. I mean, policy exchange have recently... Uh, a, a guy from your country, Eric mm. Kaufman, has produced an interesting report showing that a very high percentage of university age type people don't believe in free speech and think J.K. Rowling, you know, should be banned or something. Um, I think it's quite interesting debate because obviously it's that you know, I think it comes down to what is freedom of speech. So you know, it's it's, it's the right to express your opinion. But I think people are starting to realize i think there's been that kind of idea of freedom of speech that you can say whatever you like and, and that is generally you know what freedom of speech is but i think people are forgetting that the, the, there are not necessarily there, there are social consequences to what you might say so i think people have this notion of freedom of speech means i can say whatever i like and then there'll be no consequence to me and that is you know politically and kind of legally speaking that's generally what should you know, be but i think socially there is that kind of People are getting cancelled, as you said, because of that. But they're not getting cancelled in a legal aspect. They're getting cancelled in a social aspect. So I think there is that element of being cancelled socially. But because they are, they what they are saying, they are not thinking of the consequences of what they're saying. So, so the consequences of every you know every action has an equal opposite reaction, and you know, uh, whatever someone says might have a consequence. Um, and I think people are only now. Kind of, I, th I think especially people of privilege. So I'm generally talking kind of white, straight men, um, and and that kind of people who've been historically privileged and have not really f um, kind of had that censorship have now started to be subject to those consequences, the, the social consequences of said freedom of speech. But of course, I mean, okay, you mentioned, you know. Um, white men, but of course the, a lot of the people who are being censored or sent to Coventry or socially ostracised or in, 
in a lot of cases now visited by the police because the police, uh, you know, in the case of the, the, what happened in Brighton a few weeks ago with um, Posey, whatever she was called. Posey, Posey Parker, I think. Posey Parker. Parker yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the police have now got in touch with her and said, we want you to come in for an interview. And if you don't voluntarily come in, we're coming to get you. We'll and she did that you. during, and it happened during one of her uh, live streams as well. She was having, a, she was doing a live stream, um, and a, and the police knocked on her door. <laughs> they, yeah, it happened in the middle. of the So there are one hundred and twenty thousand people who the police have put on what they call non-crime hate databases, uh, which has has uh, significance for DBS checks and what have you. People they can't, they don't think they're actually going to get a prosecution in relation to. But they're using this device they've created completely illegally, it has no legal basis, to to come after people, particularly those who say stuff on the transgender issue. And that is overwhelmingly women. Um, so it's not just white blokes, it's not just the patriarchy uh, that is, is getting it. It's increasingly women. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. And why is it something that a lot of younger people seem actually in favour of. Yeah, like, I think that it's different and it happens to a lot of people because I can censor myself and I'm a woman and Latina. I could cover all of the minorities. It's very big thing. I think it's more anger. I think what is happening now a lot on campus is that a lot of people, while they're in class and everything, they are trying to teach you in a way with anger to start hating the, the other. So there's division between you and me and the rest is against you in a way. So that fear, that fear and anger. So I think when you play with fear, and I think that's a lot what is happening with populism as well, with Trump, with Bolsonaro, but also with the populism, with Lula, with, with all of these people that we're seeing that are part of just populism in general, the use of fear, but if you use the fear at a university level, you create what's happening now. So what happened? You have anger, a lot of people that are angry for oppression, they are angry because uh, this white straight man is going to do this and this and this and this and this and this. They are uh, sentimental of the things that happened ages ago about colonialism. Or they are just thinking about how basically Sam is a great guy. And then if you have someone that is just telling you completely the opposite, which doesn't go with the narrative that you have learned, you develop fear. So that anger that you were, that basically you kind of develop through all of these years of uni and then someone is just confronting that anger, you develop fear. So fear with anger is just the worst combination and is the worst enemy of speech. Because it just creates this resentment and it increases the feeling of victim with as well. Like now it's kind of like a price of who is the biggest victim here. If you are I don't know, you have it's, 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 I don't know if that happens to a lot of you guys, but when you have a conversation with someone, if your life is more fucked up, for example, you are better off. And it's kind of like where we got to a point where if your life, if you have more mental health issues, you're better off than someone that has not. Or um, I remember that I was with a friend and I was just talking with him and he was like kind of, we, we were having this conversation and I told him like, I don't think that if we apply for the same job, we have the same degrees, we have the same grades, I don't think that they will choose you over me, or that they will choose me over you. Probably it will be another way around. They will choose me because I'm a woman, because I have this color of skin and everything, and they wouldn't choose you even if you're better than me because you're white. They was like, do you think that's fair? And he only told me to shut up because he was just saying about how oppressed I am, and I was like, I'm actually less oppressed than you because you apply to the same job and they see your face. It's probably they will look at me and they will give a job to me because I'm a woman. Well, it seems well, it seems as though yeah, I think that's actually very interesting because it seems as though at least what you're describing it's is. Like, yeah, it's but I mean because because the whole victimhood mentality I think is is true. But you're but but when like when when we were younger, right? You know, this whole victimhood thing stems from my parents are divorced, right? I you know I I grew up in a trailer park. I mean, you know, you know do you know what I mean? And these but these are not things that are associated with race. But it seems as though what you're talking about is that now we've 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 thrown that completely off the table and we've traded it in for race. So I'm black, therefore I'm a victim. I'm 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 Latina, therefore I'm a victim. I'm a woman, therefore I'm a victim. Right? It's not like it just seems as though because I think that's what it sounds like you're describing. And if someone that actually has done nothing, and that's the problem with uh, white privilege as well. Mm. Someone that I don't think. Okay, so a lot of these guys here are white, and I don't think in their brain if they wouldn't know that that they are to have this white privilege that they are this is because you're straight and there's something wrong with you. They will. They wouldn't like. Okay, I talk with Roger, for example. I don't think we will have a conversation. <laughs> yes, 
But maybe unconsciously, someone telling you you're actually better than her is going to start thinking about that, and you're creating the social cycle where they're creating this kind of like thick bubble that doesn't go with the reality, and then that 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 is happening as well. So you have this fear, victim group mentality, anger, and this battle. So if you mix all of that, is it bound to destroy freedom of speech? And what is reality? What this mix between postmodernism and reality? So that's kind of what I'm seeing that is happening, or I don't know, a really good one is like that always happens to me when I see people with Che Guevara here like all over it and I'm like, okay, so firstly I'm from Bolivia, but I think everybody already knows that. But I think he, he got shot there, didn't he? Yeah, he got <laughs> killed in Bolivia because he, and, and it's quite, the area, like I see all of this like gay people with Che Guevara, like this really cool guy and I'm telling you, you know that he had concentration camps in Cuba for people that were homosexuals, and he wrote here, Puto, which is the meaning of, like, basically like a hooker, but a male hooker, but a really insulting thing that you say to someone that is gay, right? And when I say this kind of stuff, they just completely black out, and they start insulting me, telling that I'm, like, homophobic, that I'm, like, so is this kind of thing where even when they are confronted with truth, in this case, this idol that they have, for some reason, which was a psychopath, killer, racist, that even he didn't accept his own daughter because she looked indigenous, so you go through all of these things and you when you confront them with reality and they're like, okay, like this is not true, so then they start insulting you and they start canceling you. So you have all of these factors that make really difficult to have freedom of speech. So so how about it, Mark? I mean like I mean it, have we really traded in you know, this idea of objective victimhood, like, you know, like divorce. I mean, because you can make an argument about that, can't you? Like, you can say, my parents are divorced, so therefore my life is a little bit harder. And it seems as though what we've done is that we've traded that in for race as a vic as, as victimhood, where we've, you know, being homosexuality as victimhood. Have we done that? Like, do you think that that's... But what I, I'm struggling to understand is we can all have very different opinions about all kinds of issues, you know, uh, racial injustice, we can... Uh, sexual inequality, whatever it happens to be. We all have very, very different opinions, uh, which is fair enough. But what I don't understand is this reluctance or this refusal to discuss those differences. So when I was sort of in, engaged in politics at Warwick University, there were all kinds of differences, but primarily about economic issues in those days. Um, but very rarely did I ever come across people, even on the hard left, suggesting that I should be silenced or that people who thought like me should be silenced. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily about the, the left had a victim narrowhood about the working class in those days. So, OK, that's shifted now. You know, the left has become or the new left has become more diversified in terms of its concerns and the groups it claims have victim status. That, but what I don't understand is the compulsion to censor, to crush people just expressing different views. So the, no, no, please, you know, please, no, please go I, ahead. I've go probably ahead, spoken yeah. enough, so I'm more interested to hear yeah, you know, kind ahead, of what please. you have to say. I would also say as well that well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't only think there's a the left that actually says, I think it's actually the right, but there are conservatives also. Obviously, you might disagree with it, but I think a lot of conservatives are kind of sense of like kind of words because obviously he has such a really controversial statement but or instead of like debating it or trying to like they've kind of disagreed they've said like racism so who who's this? I'm oh right yeah yeah okay. I think what, what I'm trying to say I think a lot of people on the right also actually engage in terrible culture just in much of the do you do you want them do you want them to be censored? I think because I think that's really I think that's really the what's that issue here. I mean do you want I mean, do you think it's a good idea for people to be censored? No. No. Okay. I think I think what I'm trying to say is it goes in both ways. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's a bit hypocritical. <laughs> the right to criticize the left or counterculture, the right also does it. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm, well, I mean, where I would slightly differ from you is that there are very few people on the. As I said, when I was growing up, there were a lot of religious conservatives who certainly did want censorship. Don't really hear that now. Uh, and you certainly don't, I've never really come across mainstream people of the centre-right saying, I think the police should go and, you know, um, uh, restrict what people on the left are saying. I, I mean, is it, it, that is not something I, I mean, absolutely no different, but I, I just, I don't see any kind of significant group 
within the modern Conservative Party really agitating for greater censorship of people on political grounds. In fact, if anything, the Conservatives are going along with a lot of the left censorship if you look at the online safety bill and stuff, but yeah. So do you think that um, just as we go on, what group do you think is that responsible for that? Because obviously within the Conservative community there's kind of a division now in different that mainstream Conservatives and then more like traditional Conservatives and so that. So I've got a lot of the side of the point. Yeah. Kind of like the mainstream Conservatives are like not really messing around with them. Well, again, you might want to come back on, on the North American thing. But what I was going to say that if there are people sort of on the right, if you consider them on the right, which contradicts slightly what I was saying earlier, is that if you look at, say, the English Defence League, they're quite, well, they're very keen on stopping, say, mosques from being built. So they're quite, or very keen on censorship of people they would define as being Islamic fundamentalists. Um, yeah, so let's. You, you, it's your meeting, so. Yeah, no, that's fine. So let's let's move up. Let's move up there. Just, yeah. So let's. Can I ask you just? Um, can you define the word what censorship means to you? Because like whether it is, it is like the um, decision by a private company to just um, not be associated with someone that they see as like bad for their um, um, they just don't, don't want to be associated with that. With Kanye West, for example, because it's going to be bad for their, uh, for the for the company mm -hmm. itself, or because, and I think that's most like uh, the majority of the cases of censorship that you mentioned, they're by private companies. I don't know that. Many. So you're so you're drawing like an exam like a like a parallel between what I was saying about about Don Cherry earlier, right? That basically he had said that those comments about immigration, and so therefore. Because yeah. it's a private, so 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 so, what kind of distinction are you drawing here? Then, like, are you saying that that most types of censorship are because of that? Is that what you're I, saying? I'm saying that there are just like in a way, uh, capitalist, like mm. strictly related to capitalism, like in a way, like people don't like Kanye West because he's seen as anti-Semitic, and so like um, last year, whatever it was, doesn't want it to be doesn't want to be associated with Kanye because people won't won't buy his shoes anymore. So it's just like very much like a free choice by a private company and not so much of like an imposition by the state or by because I don't think it is possible in this day for the state to like censor people, nor legally or politically. I would hugely disagree. I mean I agree with you that private companies, when we had this conversation a bit earlier, can obviously make decisions in relation uh to their own practice as to what they're going to tolerate and not tolerate from their employees or the people they hire celebrities to, um, you know, wear their clothes or, or whatever it is. I mean, Brian Ferry, I remember getting sacked by um, Marks and Spencers um, because he'd come out with some line about, which was, I mean, purely about art, really, saying, you know, that fascism in the it was very stylish or something in the thirties, or there was great art associated with with fascism. And so Marks and Spencer's, you know, that was their decision, and fair enough to cancel his his contract. So I think there's private censorship, but but that's sort of in a way acceptable. That you know, a private institution can do what it, it, it likes. But state censorship, I think, is very, very different from the sort of stuff we're seeing in all kinds of countries. And I think we're beginning to see here. I mean, there was a, just give you one example, a Scottish feminist called Marion Miller was put on trial, you may have seen, because she flashed up. She was having a spat with a trans, pro-transgender activist, and she displayed the suffragette colours of green and purple. And a man then reported her to the police and said he'd been traumatised by seeing the suffragette <laughs> colours. And that was one of the six charges she faced. Now, the case eventually collapsed, I'm glad to say. But there is, there's a growing state, as I said, with uh, non-crime hate incident databases. There's a growing state uh, involvement um, on a whole. The police are giving themselves the right to intervene in what is communicated politically now in a way they never used to. But so I may I just have a difference of opinion I think about the feel on that. So let's come down here. So Sam, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. So I think it what it comes down to is um, instant self-application. 
So to actually engage with ideas is uh, takes a bit of work. Um, but to shut something down immediately is is a self replication You can say these ideas are wrong. On to the next thing, a bit like swiping onto something else. And that uh, in itself is kind of born hedonism. I think our age is not one of liberalism or this that the other. I think our age is one of hedonism, and that's a form of it. sort of emotivism. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you can kind of relate that back to postmodernism in the sense that postmodernism is all about. Uh, not, there not being one objective reality, but we all have subjective realities. My truth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that yeah. kind of can relate back to yeah. me. Uh, my truth is how I feel in this moment, and anything threatening that uh, threatens my instant I was wondering, going back to Luciana's point, which is interesting, because mental health is now, uh, I mean, just a sort of hugely enormous issue in this society, mm. particularly in relation to young people. In a way, it wasn't. Uh, when I was growing up, which is not to say, you know, we weren't mentally ill, but it was either sort of not identified as mental illness or people were just sort of told to sort of get on with it. And it was just explained away as, you know, teenage uh, sort of growing pains and um, uh, changes. So it was it was completely the other end, really, of the continuum. Um, but it seems to me that this whole question of, of people being depressed and young people being mentally ill possibly plugs into this hence the concept of safe spaces that you know you could be traumatized by hearing something and so that an opinion you don't like isn't just a competing view that you know you disagree with but it's actually something that is assumed to actually cause to trigger or hence trigger warnings trigger some uh, uh, you know emotional Collapse and something that's potentially dangerous. So you've been waiting to come in for some time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we've passed my point. But I wanted to know um, <laughs> what you thought about kind of public displays of um, protest and things like that, because the government actually passed a law to kind of control protest, and I think we were probably introduced to kind of deter um, these kind of you know, extinction rebellion and things like that. But then it kind of backfires on the idea of freedom of speech, really not allowing people to say what they want to say. Well, it's very interesting because that's also that's also something that happened in Canada with the Freedom Convoy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that as well. Yeah. With Justin Trudeau. I mean, this was the exact. It was the exact. I mean, he didn't pass legislation, but what he did is that he triggered the Emergencies Act, which essentially, ju- which, which essentially allowed the police to basically go into the, where the truckers were were stationed in front of Parliament in Ottawa, right, and to completely just kick like forcibly remove them, right. So, I, so I think it's akin to that. I mean, are we? I mean, is that? I mean, is is this really an issue? I mean, I'm not sure what the question is. Bearing in mind it is a conservative government that right. introduced this bill, so doesn't that kind of contradict the idea that you know conservatives are supposed to be pro freedom of speech and the reduction of state powers and you know, mm. protection of people's rights? Yeah, um, it's a really interesting question because what that bill is doing is is obviously trying to regulate the public space. Now. This is, you know, and again, it's 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 quite difficult to know where lines should be drawn if you, broadly speaking, uh, support freedom of expression. Um, and it seems to me that there is some justification for trying to restrict groups of people who are not just voicing an opinion and demonstrating in a conventional way. You know, the conventional thing of marches to Trafalgar Square, book it with the cops, you get a Saturday and you can do whatever you like in Trafalgar Square. And so that's all sort of fairly traditional um, ways of campaigning that, that trade unions uh, and others have have utilised. When you're getting groups like Extinction Rebellion, who are saying quite overtly, well, we're going to in- engage in what they call civil disobedience, but I actually think borders on on violence... Uh, because if you try to get through some of the roadblocks they've established, then uh, there can be problems with them, as I once experienced trying to get to work. Um, When they had their first sort of mass occupation of London before COVID. So it seems to me it's not entirely illegitimate for a government, forget whether you think this government is, you know, um, liberal or illiberal on freedom of speech issues, but it seems to me not entirely unreasonable for a government to say, look, this is the public space. 
there's, you don't have a, an unlimited right to block highways. Um, I think they were kind of blockading the capital, weren't they? Your, well, what the truck, well, well, the truck, well, the trucks, well, the trucks basically occupied yeah. just occupied the space, but there was still room, right? Oh, and, right you know, because okay. you know, because they weren't because they weren't it was nonviolent, yeah. Right, it wasn't the same as as what happened in Bristol with the Colson Four when they when they knocked down the statue and threw it into the river. Yeah, right? they were the I mean, whole kill the building. Yeah, they actually so, did nearly kill yeah. uh, some cops in a, in a car yeah. that was, you know, they threw a Molotov cocktail. I said, but so I don't know. Go, I mean, come back and you, perhaps you've got. I mean, where do you draw the line? I don't know. Where would you draw the line? I, I, I agree with that. I mean, you know, roadblocks and things when you're stopping emergency vehicles. And well, quite, yeah. Well, of course, I disagree with that. Um, you know, I'm a conservative. But the, the problem I see is, for instance, at the, the, the Queen's funeral, I don't think it's right to protest, but I do believe in freedom of speech. When you have someone who had a, a blank um, kind of pickup and they're going to write something on it. And the police, before he'd even written it, said, you know, you could write something that's offensive. And he wrote, not my king or something, eventually. And he got arrested for doing Oh, yeah, well, that was outrageous, yeah. clearly, yeah. I, I don't <coughs> think, you know, even though I don't agree with what he's saying, yeah. I still think that person has a right to put out what they want. Of course. As long as it's not really <coughs> it. But he was arrested for that. So is, it, is this kind of the, the, the product of the restrictions <coughs> that they're placing for bills like this, where it kind of, um, you know, suppresses noisy protests and, and offensive language and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the Public Order Act enables the police potentially to arrest you and me for wearing, you know, the wrong coloured socks or something. <laughs> I mean, it is so ill-defined that uh, it's a very dangerous piece of legislation if you have a police force who are instinctively authoritarian and seeking to use it, as they did in that context. Um, uh, but I think um, that... Broadly speaking, there has to <laughs> something has to happen to stop Extinction Rebellion doing what they're doing. Uh, they, they've got legitimate rights to protest, to march about, but they don't. It seems to me have the right to to stop trains and you know cars getting to where they have to get to. So I know it's a balance. But so okay, so I think we still have three more questions. So we'll we'll do it like this. We'll do three more questions. Yeah, and, and then, then we'll have yes. to. Then we'll have yeah, to. We'll end have it. So, to yeah. so we'll start with you, Harry. Do you also have a question as well? Is that okay? So we'll start with you, and then we'll go Harry, and then we'll go with you in the back. Yeah. Okay. I was just ask about your analogy of the uh, the flower, the flower analogy with you know you let kind of thousand flowers grow. I think Chairman Mao said that, didn't he? He obviously well, didn't I mean, believe it. <laughs> said it about freedom of speech. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that was one of his. The little red book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think yeah. I think there's a there's an element of what harm. Can that cause by, or that can cause harm by allowing, but especially with social media now and that platform being completely public, and then I think that comes into the debate: is public media, is um, social media private, or is it a public space? You know, um, and so therefore, should the state have some kind of, as you said, because public spaces are, um, you said the state should have some kind of uh, uh, intervention in the public space to allow, and I think social media is being considered public, not necessarily private now. Um, but my question to you is, if you allow, say, um, say, say, incels, for instance, they're allowed to communicate online and they and they have that freedom of speech to express their opinions. However, because of social media and you have this close knit communities forming that then express violent opinions, how can how can by allowing you know, one seed, one crazy seed to grow, if you will, that can right. then cause Harm, and I think the state. I think we can all agree the state has um, a, uh, a, a right to, that they're there to protect the citizens, and they have an obligation to protect the citizens. So how can you? I'm not saying you specifically, about, but how can someone justify um, allowing, say, one crazy seed that might then spread you know, uh, some harmful, um, insightful violence that they might not commit, but someone might like, see that and go, I agree with that, and then and then commit that act. And so I think, how can you allow the state to kind of allow certain um, permissible, uh, to be permissible to uh, incite violence, but maybe not commit it, and then allow someone else to then um, give themselves to the right? Well, well, this was an issue with Andrew, with Andrew Tate as well, uh, that basically people say, well, we need to take him off social media because, you know, people are behaving, they're being misogynists like him, so therefore we have to justify that. Yeah, it's a bit of an interesting point, for sure. Do you want to take the three points and then... Yeah, let's do the yeah, three points. So, so Harry, we'll, we'll start with you and then we'll, then we'll finish up at the top here, yeah. 
I was going to ask that you've said a lot at all about how um, the well, cancelling, for instance, can have a massive negative effect on freedom of speech and how there are uh, individuals in government uh, that you've mentioned who uh, might seek to stifle freedom of speech. I was, uh, I was wondering what you thought could be done on both an individual and an organised level to fight against that sort of, well, language, opinions, positions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, we'll just take the, we'll take the, this is, you'll be the last one, no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're waiting. <laughs> My points were kind of following on from what two people have already said. Yeah. So one of them was uh, the bill that kind of restricted people's rights to protest. I believe it was actually based off the removal of certain statues in Black Lives Matter protests. Mm. And my kind of feeling upon that is if you look back in history, every protest that now affects us today, so for example the suffragettes, at the time was considered inherently violent, inherently radical, but now, collectively, we can all agree that women should be treated equal as men. Maybe not all of us agree that, but <laughs> the general consensus <laughs> is that it was now what we believe, and it's enshrined in law that way. gender inequality should be eradicated. Um, so it's kind of, who do we give the authority to, to decipher what form of protest in a public space, or should the state be allowed to control um, what would be considered as violent in terms of protest, and that goes back to Extinction Rebellion as well, and looking again into different states, for example, um, particularly Islamic states that follow Shia law, mm -hmm. which um, is doesn't follow what certain Western views follow, and obviously we're looking at lots of inequality and lots of problems in Iran and Iraq at the moment. We could argue that that is inherently wrong, but that's the authority that is put in position and has the ability to restrict someone's freedom of speech and someone's rights. And then another point I had was, was actually about Andrew Tate, was he was removed not only because of what he perpetuated in terms of misogyny, which again was inherently violent, in very violent terms, directly targeted towards women, but also videos of him, I hate to use any sort of triggering vocabulary, but there were videos of him committing domestic acts of violence, as well as raping women, and that's what stemmed his removal from Twitter. And he was being very, he was perpetuating very violent, very misogynistic views on young impressionable males, which have a very dangerous impact to society. So again, it's really subjective to what you define as violent. So I, as a woman, would feel that Andrew Tate was inherently violent. I don't necessarily agree because he was, he had a huge platform. And I don't necessarily agree, although I do agree with the phrase that you use in terms of people are never going to fully agree and I think a healthy society should have different opinions, but he had a lot of power and a lot of influence over very influential, oh, very, it, it, uh, yeah, basically people who are very successful. And, and it's, a, it's a very interesting thing, just to kind of push back a little bit, because I know, because I know Milo Yiannopoulos is a name that, 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 you've, that you've thrown up there. Milo Yiannopoulos um, was banned off of Twitter, but he wasn't banned off of any other social media platform. But the thing with, with Milo Yiannopoulos was that he wasn't really censored. Basically, what happened with him right, was that, actually to, actually, to your point, right, was that he was, given, he was given a platform to just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And then he said something stupid, and then people just didn't want him anymore. People, they, he was, he's, 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 beyond, he's beyond the pale. He's not fit for consumption. And I think, I think this is kind of, and I think this is kind of the trade-off that we have. And, and, and then I think, so, so just to kind of disagree with you if for a little, a little bit, right? Because, because Andrew Tate, is is what Milo Yiannopoulos would have been in 2016. That they that 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 he says all of these things that are incredibly contentious, and that we we censor him. But so then so then for me, I think another question that I think is implicit here too is what would have happened if we if we had just kept Andrew Tate online? Is it possible that Andrew Tate would have done something or said something so stupid if he hasn't already? Because because he has said a lot of things that are are that are that are clearly disagreeable, right? That. At the very least, isn't it possible that eventually that he would have just said something so stupid that people just would have just been like, "Oh, here's Andrew Tate. He's going to say something dumb again." Yeah, so, like Trump, like so Trump, yeah. Sort of going in reverse order very quickly yeah. because yeah. I know <laughs> you've, you've been here a long time. Oh, they're good questions. Um, they're good questions. <laughs> they're very yeah. good questions. But um, my instinctive view is that once you start giving the state the right to dictate to us whether we can, you know see an idiot like Andrew Tate or whoever, or not see, and uh, uh, that this is really is the slippery slope. And that, that all of us have views about 
people would rather not, uh, you know, gain traction within the society that we, you know, we, we particularly dislike for whatever reasons or find annoying or whatever it is. And it's, 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 it doesn't seem to me that it's for me or any of you here to tell other people what they should be able to access on the internet. I don't believe that thing can actually cause harm. And if you do think it can cause harm to you, then, you know, don't switch it on. It's a bit like uh, dear old Mary Whitehouse, who was, you know, campaigning against porn when I was growing up. I mean, nobody was forcing her to go to some sleazy cinema in Soho, but she wanted to um, have these films banned. So my instinctive belief is let a thousand flowers uh, bloom. Um, your point about the suffragettes is the suffragettes obviously uh, had a righteous cause, um, but it doesn't seem to me that it follows that all of their activities were legitimate. Most of their campaigning was peaceful and conventionally political, but when they started, uh, you know, chucking Molotov cocktails or throwing themselves in front of horses at the Derby, it seems to me that is not a, le a legitimate form of campaigning because it impinges upon the rights of of other people. Uh, and that's where I would draw the line. Um, the removal of the statue of Edward Coulson, it seems to me, was illegitimate because it was up to Bristol City Council, an elected body, to make the decision as to whether they wanted to get rid of that statue or not. You know, it seems to me that the people of Bristol and their elected representatives um, should have made that decision one way or the other. It wasn't for a self-appointed group any more than it's for me to go and attack some or remove some statue. You know, if people start attacking Karl Marx's statue in Highgate Cemetery, well, which they have done, in fact, I think that's appalling. It's, it, it, you know, that's that nobody has the right to take a unilateral political decision, even if you think the statue, or in this case, the tomb of the person, um, you know, you, you have some fundamental objection to, because that way then just lies everybody using political violence to achieve whatever they want to achieve. And then you break down politically civilized uh, debate. Um, the incels, um, again, <laughs> always the incels. It's always, it's always yeah. the incels. It's, you see, I mean, <laughs> I don't believe that a human being can co coerce another human being simply through the articulation of an insane uh, belief or incitement to do something. I mean, would you be influenced by seeing an incel video? Of course not. Would you be influenced by seeing? Um, you know, Ajahn Chowdhury say, you know, go kill the infidel. Of course not. Would you be influenced by a Ku Klux Klan video? Of course not. We ultimately, we have to have responsibility for our own lives and what we do. And seeing some flickering images or hearing the words of a lunatic, um, it seems to me cannot coerce an adult with agency, which is what we all are, into doing something we wouldn't otherwise choose to do. It's just my view. Sorry, you wanted to come back on this. I know if you want to come back, please do. I mean, if, is that, if that is um, okay? So I know we have to go soon. Yeah. We, so yeah. What, what do you think, Lucy? Because we're we're over by by yeah. by about fifteen minutes. I don't know what you want to yeah. do. Because we can we can well, we, we can call. Okay. Oh. So, I mean, if you're happy to go for another five minutes, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It's just I know some people want to come back, so it just seems. No, I just wanted to ask as well. What do you think of like certain movements like sort of like freedom for you, like policy for you, creative, what's happening with creative art? Well, do you think like certain people in the West are just following those moves to try to not that trying to critically and allow them to go in Iran and Ukraine and maybe realizing real that there are Western versions of those versions are less than the truth and that is a lot of substantive stories? Well, that's why there should be a full contestation of ideas. I mean, if the, if the pro-Russian lot want to put out their views, you know, then let them and then we can all decide who's telling the truth, who's not telling the truth. I mean, I don't see you can legitimately shut up any particular perspective. Well, it's kind of like links to certain countries being boycotted. Do you think that, for example, like Russia will be boycotted or like invading Ukraine, whereas, for example, the US invading Iraq, then you can tell 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think to some extent we're seeing it with Qatar. Um, so there are a lot of legitimate, you know, reasons to object to what is going on within that country. But Russia got the World Cup, didn't they? I mean, I think we had a deal with the Qataris and they sort of helped each other get the World Cup. But when Russia got the World Cup, nobody was particularly bothered. Well, there's, you know, lots of homophobic stuff, obviously, going on in Russia under, under Mr. Mr. Putin. So it seems to me that the great sort of virtue signalers within our own society kind of are quite selective as to, you know, which countries they go after. And as somebody made the point, actually, when we had the World Cup in 1966, homosexuality was actually still illegal. So, you know, <laughs> so that, yeah, nobody's entirely sort of virtuous, but I think we live in an age when everybody's looking for kind of trying to define everybody as baddies and goodies. Now, now we said that this was going to be the last. We said that this was going to be the last one, so we're going to make you the last one, and that's. Sorry, but I also. I can, yeah. Sorry, I can't remember the point you made because I'm uh, going to see now. So my mm-hmm. question was, what can be done on an individual? Oh right, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I I think all we can do throughout history, there are, the zeitgeist changes. The European Enlightenment led to you know, the enshrinement of freedom of speech and these values. These values are now broadly under attack. We're experiencing a kind of counter uh, enlightenment. And that has the momentum with it. But those of us who believe in smaller liberal values, we have no alternative but, well, to have meetings like this where things are discussed, where we practice the virtue of discussion, even if we uh, disagree on particular points and i think it, the danger is that we're going to it's going to become normalized particularly for younger people that things shouldn't be discussed and that it's not normal to be in a situation where you have com- competing viewpoints and that i think once that culture of liberalism uh, disappears declines then in fact political authoritarianism um, has more chance of re-establishing itself. And so I think we're sort of in, at a sort of crossroads um, in Western society as to whether political liberalism is going to survive or whether in 30 years' time these tendencies are just going to, you know, more and more issues we're going to be told are things that shouldn't even be discussed. So we have no alternative. But so what you're doing is 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 a great job. You should be just carrying on organising meetings and all over actually the country. I mean, I mean, to a variety of universities where there are now free speech societies, and some of them can't operate overtly um, because of the student unions, but they still do it. You know, they meet, they find we, um, we have, we have subterranean ways of doing it. We have a secret handshake. Oh, really? Are you <laughs> <like today? laughs> Um, okay, so okay, so, sorry. I think, so I think you had so we're gonna so I, I've been very nice. It's probably because I'm Canadian. So, but we're, we're for real now. Yeah. For real now, you're gonna be the last one. Yeah. No, okay, I was just yeah. Bring up, um, so you obviously said seeing like one video, and uh, I, I agree with you. I think everyone is rational to an extent, and people are. And are we morally responsible for our own conduct? However, that is that is what I would like to kind of contradict in the sense that say someone is part of a cult, you know, and and they and they are then brainwashed. Are they then? Um, their own moral agents because well, they are part of the cult. I mean, can you be brainwashed? I don't. I can't be brainwashed. I mean, I mean, Why do you think you can be brainwashed? Can be brainwashed really? The right. I, 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 so, for instance, social media. If you create a um, a, a bubble with yeah. the due to the algorithm of what you watch. So, say you watch a couple of videos on uh, you know, kind of more alt right stuff, and then it gradually deteriorates to kind of. And we've seen this just a lot with kind of. Um, young adults, <laughs> and um, I mean, for instance, the Plymouth shooter, the, ma- the man who. Uh, oh, Jake Davison, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, you know, they, they <laughs> his um, computer, and they found streams and streams and streams of um, incel content and. and, um, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> information that was. that inherently, I would say, influenced, his, influenced him to. Do yeah, but they didn't determine. I mean, he's 
ultimately responsible for carrying out atrocious act. Nobody else is to blame for that. Yeah. But also, what happened was with kids, though. I can understand the brainwash when they're trying to put these gender ideologies in kids. That, <coughs> that, that makes a massive difference. They're like, okay, we're adults, right? Like, we can decide to read something different at the end of the day. I came here, and the moment that I sat down with my class about global studies, I realized I didn't agree with anything that they were saying to me, and I just heard myself and read completely the opposite, which is the belief that I have. But when you're a kid, when you're a baby, like maybe that's where you're going into, like you're a half year old and they're including the gender ideology and all of this stuff. I think that that's when you can get very much, when you can, you're more in your brain. I, mean, I, was, I was talking more kind of the, the young, uh, kind of teenage to, to kind of early adult <coughs> men, which are generally the ones who are kind of committing these these atrocities. And I, I, I see what you mean, the kind of the um, the people that are being influenced by it. It's yeah. only a small minority. If everyone was getting indoctrinated, then it would be... Yes, right. Okay, so, so wait yeah. a minute. So, so, there are in America. So, well, no, so, yeah, no, so, what, <laughs> so, guys, so, 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 gentlemen, just one sec. So, so Mark, final word on this. Because we, we, right. we, we did this. I, I so, what do you think, Mark? Final, final word. The words of the great Russian philosopher. I don't know how many of you are fans of Ayn Rand. I check her out. If we have a tough crowd, we have a tough crowd. But basically, Ayn Rand said, you know, liberate your mind, take responsibility for your own mind. Uh, don't allow yourself um, to be or, or to, to, to be convinced that you are not responsible for your own actions. Connect your consciousness to objective reality. And so we're all ultimately responsible for how we behave and what we view and nothing you see on that thing, no matter how depraved, disgusting, can force you to do anything you don't want to do. And that's part of being an adult. As Immanuel Kant said, you know, before the Enlightenment, we lived like children because we were told that everything was predetermined by God and he says I'm now living as an adult let's live as adults ladies and gentlemen Mark Lennoning <laughs> thank you uh, guys, guys we're going to have more debate tomorrow like a weekly meeting so on Tuesdays at 6pm so if anyone wants to join us we're going to debate about should we remove offensive statues so if you want to come and debate the whole one so, 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 so